Well, it's uh, Friday afternoon again, so it's time for another episode of Friday Afternoon Physics. Today, we're going to be studying a toy that everyone has seen. It's called Newton's Cradle. And here's our, our kind of old, repaired Newton's Cradle. The balls are kind of rusty, and we've had to replace one leg, but it still works. And what happens is if I pull one ball back and swing it, one ball comes out from the collision on the other side. And if I pull two balls back, then two balls um, uh, 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 bounce out from the other side. And this is not very well adjusted, and so the, all the balls begin to swing after a while. Uh, but why does it do that? Why is it that when one ball hits these four balls, only one ball comes from the other side? Well, every physics student knows the answer. The steel balls all have the same mass, and the collisions between them are almost exactly elastic. Nothing is lost to friction. This means that when one moving ball collides with one stationary ball, all of the momentum and energy is transferred from one to the other. So when one ball hits a whole row of balls, a series of individual collisions transfers the momentum and energy down the line, and the last ball goes off from the end with the original speed. We have to think of the collision of the balls as a rapid sequence of individual collisions. So how do we know that that's really what's going on in Newton's cradle? Well, we have an experiment here where we're going to record the sound made by the colliding balls. And our theory predicts that in one collision of this ball with these four other balls, there are four individual single ball collisions, or collision of a pair of balls. And we'll see if we can detect that in the sound that we capture. So let me start recording the sound. And then... So here's a view of the sound file recorded by the computer. Here's one of those collisions. It actually is, a, is a, an event that takes place over a, a, a few milliseconds. Now, here you can't tell that there are um, more than about two collisions, but if you look at some of the other collisions, and let's see if I can scan over to another one, four distinct events. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, Peter, what have we got here? Well, as you see, uh, we have a demonstration similar to Newton's cradle, right. except for our balls are rolling on a track. Okay. Now, if you take a ball, start it up higher than the others, let it start rolling, it transfers the momentum in a similar way. However, because they're rolling, the transfer does not work out as well. Okay. Let's try it again. Whoa! Wait a second. That, that, didn't, that didn't work the same. No, it didn't. Why not? The reason is the first of the stationary balls is really a strong magnet. The ball is pulled toward the magnet and hits it going pretty fast. Its momentum is transferred along the line just like a Newton's cradle. The last ball leaves fast. And because it is further from the magnet, it is not slowed down much on its way out. So this setup gives the ball a net boost. Watch it again. Now, if we can give a ball a boost with a magnet, what if we line up several magnetic boosters in a row? Then we get a device called a Gauss rifle. Okay, in the Gauss rifle, we've set up a set of magnets with two balls on the back side of each magnet and we'll let a single ball approach. <laughs> Let's see that again at 600 frames per second. Even at this speed, it's over quickly, so we'll slow down things even more. Each stage of the Gauss rifle shoots the ball ahead faster, and the final ball can knock down an aluminum can. The final arrangement of balls and magnets, with one ball on each side of each magnet, has a lower magnetic energy than the original one. That's the source of energy in the Gauss rifle. We've held our magnets in place with sticky tape on the ruler, but sometimes 
things do not work out so neatly. So allow me to present the Astro Blaster. It's a toy you can buy, and it's a stack of four um, um, rubber balls, uh, very elastic, and uh, and they're on a on a central post, and they're designed so that the collisions between the balls very efficiently transfer energy to the top of them, and so it'll go pretty high. So Peter, Peter's going to try this out for us, uh, and I'm going to flee to safety. All right, so. Ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Oh, Let's consider a rather idealized model of the Astro Blaster. There are four balls perfectly lined up one on top of the other, and all of the collisions among the balls are perfectly elastic. The balls are set up to have a ratio of mass one to one third to one sixth to one-tenth. That is, the top ball is only one-tenth as massive as the bottom one. And they fall together and have the same speed moving downward at impact. Now collisions between the floor and the balls and among the balls transfers all of the kinetic energy of the whole Astro Blaster to the top ball, which flies upward with four times the original falling speed which means that top ball could, in principle, reach a height 16 times that from which the Astro Blaster was dropped. Let's take a look at the Astro Blaster at 600 frames per second. It does not fall perfectly upright, and the collisions are not perfectly elastic. As a result, the three lower balls still have some kinetic energy after the top red ball leaves upward. But this energy is much less than before. So the red ball zooms away fast with the lion's share of the kinetic energy launched high into the air by a cascade of collisions.